Welcome to the latest edition of the ECG 5-Minute Consult, GEMS' ECG of the Month, brought to you by paramedic Troy Kennedy, Dr. John Hayden, and myself, where we teach you foundational ECG knowledge using the primary survey approach from our book, ECG for First Responders, available on Amazon. Let's take a look at today's case. You arrive on scene to find a 23-year-old male with a chief complaint of racing heart and lightheadedness. He states that the symptoms began about 25 minutes ago, suddenly, while watching TV. His roommate dialed 911 immediately as he was concerned for his friend, has no means of transportation, and they live a considerable distance from the nearest hospital. The patient denies chest pain, shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion. He denies any history of illicit drug use or smoking. He states he exercises regularly and has an active job as a construction worker. Additionally, he denies any history of medical problems and does not take any medications. On exam, he is ANO times 4, skin is warm, pink, and dry, cardiovascular exam is significant for a fast heart rate, but you do not hear any murmurs, gallops, or rubs, and pulses are 2 plus in upper and lower extremities bilaterally. No sign of JVD or pilodema. Lungs are cleared auscultation in all fields bilaterally with no adventitious sounds, and the remainder of the history, physical, and review of systems is unremarkable. We're going to obtain an ECG, but before we do, let's review the steps in our primary survey of interpretation. As we examine this patient's ECG, we will be seeking to answer these four questions. 1. The rate. Is the heart rate too fast or too slow, causing cardiovascular instability? 2. The rhythm. Is the rhythm supraventricular or ventricular in origin? 3. The ST segments. Are they consistent with an ST elevation myocardial infarction STEMI or a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and STEMI? And lastly, the T waves. Are the T waves consistent with a STEMI or N STEMI? So with this in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at this patient's ECG. To assess the rate, we'll choose an R wave that falls on a bold line of the ECG to make it easier for us to count. We will count the number of large boxes between R waves. If the preceding R wave fell here, the rate would be 300, and if it fell here, the rate would be 150. So since the preceding R wave fell just shy of two large boxes, we will estimate that this heart rate is about 180. We will obtain a complete set of vitals, which yields a BP of 120 over 70, respiratory rate of 20, SpO2 of 98%, and a temperature of 97 degrees Fahrenheit. Though the patient's heart rate is significantly elevated, his blood pressure, oxygenation, and physical exam findings seem to suggest that he is hemodynamically stable despite the high heart rate, at least for right now. Next, let's look at the rhythm. We would normally see P waves in a rhythm that is sinus in origin, though we don't see any here. But since the rate is so fast, it's likely that the P waves are in fact there, but are buried within the preceding T waves. The QRS complexes all seem to march out evenly, which means that this rhythm is regular. Additionally, our QRS complex appears to be narrow, that is, less than or equal to three small boxes or 0.12 seconds wide. This rhythm is most likely supraventricular in origin, and with the significantly elevated heart rate, we can call this supraventricular tachycardia, or SVT. Moving on to the ST segments, the ST segment is where the QRS complex ends and where the T wave begins. Now the ST segment should be congruent with the isoelectric line, that is the line between the end of the T wave and beginning of the P wave. Elevation of the ST segment can indicate myocardial infarction, while depression can indicate myocardial ischemia, early infarction, or a non-ST elevated myocardial infarction and STEMI. In this ECG, there actually appears to be diffuse ST depression, which given the fast heart rate is most likely due to a rate-dependent decrease in coronary perfusion. As we mentioned when examining the rhythm, these T waves are most likely hiding the P waves. Otherwise, our T waves appear unremarkable. We see that AVR and V1 are inverted as they should be normally, and the rest are upright. Now that we've determined that this patient is in supraventricular tachycardia and is at least currently hemodynamically stable, which of these options would be the next best step to take? Would it be A, give 5 milligrams of labetalol IV, B, perform the Valsalva maneuver, C, give 6 milligrams of adenosine IV, D, perform synchronized cardioversion, or E, immediate transport utilizing lights and sirens? The correct answer is B, Valsalva maneuver. This is a technique named after Dr. Antonio Maria Valsalva, who lived in the 17th century. This method can be performed by having the patient 
Attempt forceful exhalation against a closed airway, such as having them blow into the end of a 10cc syringe as hard as they can, as if they're trying to expel the plunger, or by having the patient bear down forcefully as if having a bowel movement. This creates a very brief increase in blood pressure, but decreases preload, leading to decreased blood pressure and cardiac output. The brain senses this and then decreases parasympathetic stimulation to the heart while increasing sympathetic stimulation to the peripheral vasculature, resulting in peripheral vasoconstriction. When the patient relaxes, preload is then increased, meaning that now the heart is ejecting an increased amount of blood against peripheral vessels that are constricted, which creates an overshoot in blood pressure, stimulating a compensatory parasympathetic response mediated by the vagus nerve, which decreases heart rate by acting on the sinoatrial and atrioventricular nodes. Now I know that's a huge mouthful of information, and even so, that's just scratching the surface on the physiology of the Valsalva maneuver. If you're interested to learn more about it, I suggest searching online for the four phases of the Valsalva maneuver. Regarding the other answer choices, I will say that we were being kind of tricky by including answer choice C. Per ACLS guidelines, adenosine would not be wrong as a first-line treatment for SVT, but we want to emphasize the principle of starting with the least invasive maneuvers before moving to more invasive interventions, or even while more invasive interventions are being prepared. For example, having the patient perform the Valsalva maneuver while you're drawing up adenosine. That way you'll be ready if the Valsalva doesn't work. If the initial dose of 6 mg of adenosine is ineffective, a repeat dose of 12 mg can be given. If the rhythm still does not convert, there's a possibility the rhythm could actually be something else, such as a flutter or junctional tachycardia masquerading as SVT, in which case rate control with a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker may be an appropriate choice, or if the rhythm is refractory to adenosine, an antiarrhythmic infusion such as with amiodarone can be considered. Please refer to your local protocols or medical director for specific instructions on that, as different EMS systems can vary both in regard to guidelines as well as to which medications are routinely carried. Finally, if our patient had been unstable, that is, hypotensive, demonstrating altered mental status, showing signs of shock or acute heart failure, or having ischemic chest discomfort, then going directly to synchronized cardioversion would have been the correct option. Well, that's all for today. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of the ECG 5-Minute Consult. If you'd like to learn more about ECG interpretation, check out our book, ECG for First Responders, available on Amazon. Thanks for your support, and we look forward to seeing you again next time.